Um, yeah, so the topic of my talk today is the uh, truncal interfacial plane block, the way forward. So, so the outline of my topic, I will share with you some of the blocks that we do for abdominal surgery and also for the blocks that we can do for chest wall surgery. And finally, I would like to share something that what is the way forward for uh, interfacial plane blocks. So what is uh, interfacial plane block? It's just simply injecting a uh, local anesthetic into a facial plane that uh, result in spread of the LA towards the targeted uh, neural targets, I mean the nerve that runs through the fascia. So we know that this, uh, the deep layer, the deep fascia that surround the muscle are uh, usually uh, uh, some of the nerves and vascular structure will run through this deep fascia. So the theory is um, by injecting um, the local anesthetic into this fascia, the local anesthetic get carried by the action of the muscle and the movement of the muscle towards certain uh, nerves that pass through this muscle. And it will result in a uh, certain effect like, like analgesia, Sometimes motor block, sometimes sympathetic block. Uh, depends on what nerve that the, the, that the LA acts on. So, so with ultrasound, yeah. Because of ultrasound, uh, it's because of ultrasound nowadays, uh, every now and then you will hear a new interfacial block being uh, produced or being reported by uh, certain uh, regional anesthetists around the world. Why? Because uh, ultrasound has led to the discovery of more facial planes. Uh, we are able to visualize facial plane better. We are able to get the needle to more accurately place in the interfacial plane. We are making interfacial plane block more safer. So that's why we are hearing more and more of these blocks. Every now and then, one new block will come out, pop up, be reported, and uh, being very efficacious, patients very satisfied, but then you try to do it yourself, <laughs> then you fail. So yeah, but um, yeah, and then um, we are then certain interfacial plane block like ESP quadratus lumborum. People are trying to um, make it uh, a replacement for paravertebral and uh, also epidural nerve blocks. Yep. So is that possible? Well, uh, still questionable. And um, together with the use of ultrasound, there's a paradigm shift actually in the surgical practice. We are seeing the surgeon shifting more and more towards uh, minimal invasive surgery. And also they are going to incorporate more and more the enhanced recovery protocol. We want patients to recover faster, get out of hospital faster, free up our beds, so that more patients can come in. So, so we want patients to move after surgery, early mobilization. And a part of it, part of the strategy is multimodal analgesia. So there is, is so the question is, uh, is there a role for this interfacial plane block is, as part of multimodal analgesia? Okay. So what are the problems with interfacial plane blocks? Yeah, the problem can be boiled down to the efficacy. Sometimes the efficacy is not as good. The duration of block is short. The, there's inconsistent uh, sensory block. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't get it. And the evidence is still lacking. So why is it the, the block is inconsistent? Because many go back to anatomy because of the fascia itself. Sometimes when you... Uh, inject LA into a fascia, you saw the split, but actually you're splitting one fascia only. Classical example is your quadratus lumborum, uh, and erector spiny plane. Sometimes there are two fascia layers, sometimes there are three fascia layers. And it's not easy to visualize these uh, different, different fascia layers under ultrasound. And sometimes you successfully inject the LA into the fascia, but because of anatomical variation, the fusion of the fascia and the fascia fuse before it reaches, any nerve passes through it, so there's no effect. And of course, 
the nerve variation of the nerve. Sometimes the fur nerve passes through the fascia as reported by someone. Sometimes in another patient, it doesn't. Then comes uh, another problem of uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity. With the introduction of ultrasound, actually peripheral nerve block has become safer. One of the reasons because we actually managed to reduce the uh, volume of local anesthetic given for peripheral nerve block. However, with the introduction of uh, facial plane block, we actually increased the volume given because interfacial plane block, we, in order for the LA to reach the targeted nerve, we need to give volume. So there is a concern that there will be, might be an a increased risk of a systemic a local anesthetic toxicity among patients. So let's go to uh, abdominal surgery. So tap block. Well, tap block is uh, not a very, uh, uh, it's not unfamiliar. I'm sure everyone have done tap block before. It was introduced at, as early as 2001 as a blind landmark technique. Then uh, it's, uh, it's a technique that we use to block the anterior lateral abdominal wall, mainly from T6 to L1. But now with uh, ultrasound, we are able to define uh, more clearly uh, what are what are the uh, the different different approach to the transverse abdominis plane yeah just let me show this slide is actually i want to show you that um, how you trace the transverse abdominis muscle itself so if you start from the midline the linear alba here under ultrasound you see the linear alba and you scan you move your probe rotate your probe in the subcostal region, and you will see the rectus abdominis muscle. Below the rectus abdominis muscle, you will start to see the transverse abdominis muscle appear. And as you slide more laterally, subcostally, you will see the transverse abdominis muscle below the linea semi lunaris. And if you slide lateral some more, you will see the classical tap uh, layer, the, the three layer muscle. External oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis muscle. This is where we usually do our tap block. But with the ultrasound, we are able to uh, further push the probe more posteriorly until the transverse abdominis muscle ends as the aponeurosis. Here we can see the quadratus lumborum block. This is where we do another version of the tap block or we do this, or it can be also known as the quadratus lumborum block. So, subcostal tap block is very simple. We just uh, um, infiltrate local anesthesia between the anesthetic between the rectus abdominis muscle and the transverse abdominis muscle at the subcostal region there, um, there itself. So this is uh, this technique is usually used for uh, anterior abdominal wall surgery covering area from T6 to T9. However, there are um, people who do a uh, oblique subcostal and extend the infiltration right down, follow the transverse abdominis muscle right down as far as possible. And some people have even inserted catheter through in the transverse abdominis plane. Uh, uh, yeah, so to continue the local anesthetic infusion. And some people have even done bilaterally, bilateral uh, oblique subcostal catheters to give um, local anesthetic continuously throughout the operation for upper abdominal wall surgery. The lateral tap, uh, well, lateral tap is very commonly done. Uh, mainly, uh, you just place the probe at the um, mid axillary line between the costal margin and iliac crest, and you will see the classical three layer muscle. And you infiltrate the local anesthetic between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscle. Uh, this is usually done for uh, surgery below the umbilicus, like example, cesarean section, hysterectomy. But if you extend, if you slide your probe further down and you place your local anesthetic, at the aponeurosis, at the, at the end of the transverse, you see the, uh, the transverse abdominal muscle end and into a form of aponeurosis above the quadratus lumborum muscle. If you place your 
uh, local anesthetics here instead of more uh, laterally, you place it more posteriorly, you end up doing what we call a lateral quadratus lumbarum block or a posterior tap block. So um, yeah, the main difference is the duration of uh, analgesia. So other versions of transversus abdominis spleen block, people do dual tap blocks, uh, mainly a subcostal plus a lateral or posterior transversus abdominis spleen block, or they can do a four quadrant tap block. So you do all four quadrants to cover for mainly for midline laparotomy. Well, what are the evidence to support the quadratus lumborum? Uh, sorry, to support the transverse abdominis plane block so far, so far, because this block being the most uh, historically the longest being practiced. So uh, there are quite a number of uh, meta analysis published. However, the quality of evidence is actually quite moderate. So one of the meta analysis is, uh, was published in 2015 to measure the analgesic efficacy of a transverse abdominis plane block. It comprises of about 31 RCTs, uh, about 1,600 patients. But however, the problem is the surgery that involved, uh, there's so many types of surgery involved, mainly, but majority of the surgery involved is cesarean delivery and also hysterectomy. So yeah, and majority of the, the block that this was uh, studied here was, uh, I think, lateral tap. Yep. So, yeah. And the, the block was either given to, uh, for patient under GA. It was also given for patient under spinal with or without intrathecal morphine. So what did they found out? They actually found out that there is a reduction of uh, morphine usage during the first six hours, but it's not much. It's just six milligram only. So it's not the, the, the impact is not very high. And, but, and those given intrathecal morphine had no difference. So we understand uh, because the uh, intrathecal morphine itself provides a very good analgesia already. And the quality of evidence is moderate only for this, uh, this meta-analysis. And actually there's no statistical difference for secondary outcome like pain score at six hours, morphine consumption at 24 hours, but one thing worth noted is that actually there is only very little complication reported. One patient had anaphylactoid reaction, one patient had bruises. So in, in, uh, in conclusion, it's, the tap block is safe, however, not very efficacious. Then another meta-analysis was uh, published in 2017, trying to measure the clinical safety and effectiveness of transverse abdominis plane block. This one included uh, 56 RCT, about 3,000 patients. Again, the, the um, operation involved a cesarean section, hysterectomy, uh, some even cholecystectomy, laparoscopic surgery, laparotomy. So one thing uh, from this uh, study is that actually the 24-hour morphine consumption post-operatively, they found no difference if you use a uh, transverse abdominal stain block or you use uh, local wound infiltration. So yeah, what we can infer from this study is that if your surgery is like is minimal invasive, it doesn't matter whether you give a block or you use a uh, local infiltration of the wound. But however, there is a bit of uh, um, the increase in time to first analgesic require, uh, re request in the tap block group. And also there's a very little side effect like nausea, vomiting and sedation in the tap block group. Again, so again, um, it shows that the tap block is quite safe, but not so efficacious. Uh, this study actually is trying to show that the posterior tap block produce a prolonged analgesia effect compared to your lateral tap block. It's actually in this study, it quote, uh, quoted up to the posterior tap block can provide analgesia which resulted in reduced in post-operative morphine consumption up to 48 hours. Right. Next, I would like to share about the quadratus lumborum block. So this block is actually, uh, the nomenclature for this block is, uh, yeah, previously people uh, will name it QL1, QL2, 
QL2, QL3. So the QL1 is actually a lateral QL, which is actually, in fact, a form of posterior transversus abdominis plane block, where the local anesthetic is placed uh, lateral to the uh, lateral to the the QL muscle, which is inside that, yeah, uh, the, the uh, like uh, what we uh, what I described for the posterior tap just now. The QL two, on the other hand, the LA is uh, placed between the quadratus lumborum muscle and the erector spinae muscle. The QL three, on the other hand, the LA is deposited between the quadratus lumborum muscle and the psoas muscle. So um, there were many uh, uh, theories behind the mechanism of how the quadratus lumborum block works. Um, the main theory is that the LA found its way through the quadratus lumborum muscle into the paravertebral space. So yeah, we are trying to reach the paravertebral space using the quadratus lumborum muscle. So yeah. But this is uh, more for transmuscular or anterior quadratus lumborum blocks. So this is an illustration to show that you can see that the, actually the quadratus lumborum muscle origin from the L1 uh, transverse process until L4. So using this anatomical knowledge, we try to, when we insert the, the LA through the quadratus lumborum muscle at the level of L3, usually L3, because it's difficult to insert beyond L, up above L3 because of the anatomical, the, the muscles, and because the rib cage is in the way and also the arcuate ligament of the diaphragm is also in the way. So usually we'll end up inserting it at the L3 level and the LA will find its way through the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia into the paraphernalia. So patient usually in the lateral position or supine position with the lateral tilt. So you, you usually have to end up using a low frequency curvy linear probe because you want to visualize the vertebral body with the transverse process. It's a very deep structure, more than five centimeters. It's very difficult to visualize using the linear, high frequency linear probe. So, so you place the probe at the mid axillary line and between the subcostal margin and the iliac crest and you slide the probe posteriorly to visualize what we know as the shamrock sign, the shamrock leaf sign, and all the thumb sign. So this is what I mentioned by the, uh, when you use the curvilinear probe, you slide, slide the probe posteriorly, you look for the vertebral body, usually the vertebral body of the uh, uh, lumbar three vertebra, or la, uh, then you will see the, the, that appears like a hand, and the transverse process will appear like a thumb, and the erector spinae muscle, quadratus lumborum muscle, psoas muscle will appear like a leaf, tree leaf of the shamrock leaf. So this is the, called the shamrock sign, and this is called the thumb sign. So if we are do, uh, to do uh, the QL1, the QL1, which is a lateral QL, we will deposit the LA here. If we were to do a QL2 or a posterior QL block, we will insert the in, uh, inject the LA between the QL and the erector spinae muscle. If we were to do a transmuscular or, or anterior QL block, we are going to insert the needle right through the back in between the QL muscle and the psoas muscle and insert the LA and inject the LA here. So yeah, if you are performing a lateral or posterior QL, you can insert the needle from the direction of the anterior abdominal wall in the anterior to posterior direction. But if you are going to do a transmuscular QL, you it's not safe to for you to insert the, the needle from the abdominal wall because you might puncture into the abdomen. So it's safer for you to inject from the back. Right? Yeah, this is a lateral QL. This is the quadratus lumborum muscle. This is a transverse abdominis muscle. This is the, exactly the same like we do a posterior test. Right? With a bit of lateral tube. Sometimes you can achieve this. But for the anterior quadratus lumborum uh, block, you, may, you need to uh, place your patient in the lateral position and inject from the back. Uh, this is the spinous process, and you're actually injecting slightly uh, 
lateral to the spinous process, above the transverse process, through the back, in through the rectus spinae muscle, through the quadratus lumborum muscle, into the space between the quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle. So what are the evidence? Well, actually there are RCTs for this uh, block, uh, for hysterectomy, caesarean section, hemicolectomy, pediatric inguinal hernia repair, laparoscopic nephrectomy. So the main advantage is that the prolonged analgesic effect up to 48 hours. So actually, um, yeah, newer evidence are coming out for this block, especially the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block. Yeah, because it is it has a potential to as a as a so-called paravertebral block for the abdomen. But uh, we still still uh, need evidence. But so far the, the evidence has shown that the, the, this quadratus lumborum block can provide prolonged analgesic effect for patients undergoing laparotomy. But however, there are some safety issues with this, with this block, especially the transmuscular uh, quadratus lumborum block because of the uh, proximity to the psoas compartment. So you may, your patient might get quadricep weakness and, and people have used this uh, block for total hip replacement also, and it works. So uh, yeah, and uh, because of the sheer volume of this block, there's a risk of LA toxicity, but so far uh, none has been reported yet. No, no, none has been reported, uh, but hypotension has been reported. And also because of you are doing transmuscular uh, quadratus or more you are injecting, uh, you are putting a needle through muscles, deep muscles. You are always concerned about coagulopathy. Next, I'll move on to the regional anesthesia for chest wall. Well, um, wow. So this is a very busy slide. I hope you can digest it because what I'm trying to portray to you that over the past uh, maybe five, six years. So many uh, interfacial plane block has been introduced for the chest wall. And each has this, maybe each, uh, actually some of these blocks are actually the same block, describing the same block, but using different names. And some of these blocks are at the same area, but just because of the uh, variation in technique or maybe the injection site is slightly different, different fascia plane, then they form a new block. So, and this slide is to show you, uh, if in case you don't understand, this is the sternum, this is the chest wall. This is the sternum, this is the spine, this is the transverse process. There are actually about 10 types of uh, interfacial plane block that, uh, that has been introduced to anesthetize the parasternal area right up to the whole chest wall. So the, the principle is that if you want to anesthetize the uh, anterior lateral chest wall, you can uh, anesthetize the intercostal nerve at the nerve free nerve ending around here, anterior to lateral side. But if you want to anesthetize the whole chest wall from anterior up to lateral up to posterior, you need to go nearer to the spinal cord. You need to go nearer to the spinal cord. That, that's where your erector spinae plane block comes in. And besides erector spinae, people have uh, also described retro lamina and all this uh, rhomboid intercostal. Uh, but today I'm going to introduce to you a little bit only. I'm going to start with the uh, pecs and serratus plane block uh, because this one has uh, is quite long already and quite established. It's uh, described by Blanco. So the PEX1 block is actually blocking the lateral and medial pectoral nerve between the PEC major and PEC minor. We deposit the LA between the PEC major and PEC minor. Then Blanco described further uh, a combination of uh, the PEX1 just now and another injection at the plane between the PEC pectoralis minor and serratus anterior plane at the level of the fourth rib at the mid uh, anterior axillary line. Sorry, anterior axillary line. That's called the Pax two. So that is why he described this because he, he needed a block that can spread to the long thoracic nerve and also to block the intercostal nerve. Then Blanco further described the serratus uh, uh, plane block. 
he found that when you inject a local anesthetic up to 30 cc between the latissimus dorsi and the uh, and the uh, serratus anterior muscle at the level of the mid axillary line you can actually cause uh, anesthesia, uh, anesthesia to the uh, sensory anesthesia to the anterior lateral chest wall so this is the description of the pex1 uh, by blanco Actually, the probe is placed in the coraco acromio fossa. It's actually, it, the technique is similar to when you do a brachial plexus block at the infraclavicular level. But instead of identifying the, uh, the axillary artery, you're actually identifying the uh, pec major and pec minor muscle. And uh, you are actually trying to identify, you can also try to identify the uh, um, Thoraco amacromial artery, which runs through between these two muscles. The reason why, because the lateral pectoral nerve actually runs alongside the artery. Yeah, so by injecting the in this plane, you have a higher chance to catch these two uh, nerve, which is um, uh, responsible for the analgesic effect for mastectomies, breast surgery, white local excisions. However, if you need to do an axillary clearance, you need to block the long thoracic nerve, you need to block the uh, intercostal nerve, then you need to slide your probe down to the anterior axillary line at the level of the fourth rib to identify the serratus anterior plane, which, is lies, which lies just above the rib, a small plane above the rib. So you deposit 20 mils of local anesthetic here. So what we do now, um, at least what I practice is actually I do not give two separate injections. I would give the injection here at the uh, level of the anterior axillary line at the fourth rib or third rib. And I would give 20 mils at the serratus plane here. Then I would just withdraw my needle between the uh, pec major and pec nine minor and deposit 10 mils of local anesthetic there. Okay. How about the serratus plane block? Uh, you need to go to the mid axillary line over the fifth rib or maybe the fourth rib. Okay, you need to identify the, the latissimus dorsi muscle and the serratus anterior muscle and inject up to 30 mils of local anesthetic uh, in this plane. Actually, there are two types of description. One is the superficial one, superficial serratus plane block where you deposit the LA between the uh, latissimus dorsi and the serratus anterior muscle. There's another deep serratus plane block where you deposit the same amount of LA between the serratus anterior muscle and the rib. So that's called the deep serratus plane muscle. We don't know which one is more efficacious than the other. Looks like the same. Okay, the evidence for PEX2. Well, um, uh, actually there's only uh, one RCT published in 2019, uh, sorry, one uh, meta-analysis published in 2019 of 13 RCTs involving about 815 patients, mostly undergoing mastectomy. Uh, the quality of the evidence, however, is uh, intermediate to high. So yeah, it, we can reduce the 24-hour opioid consumption compared with no block uh, up to 13 milligram of oral morphine equivalent. So, uh, and it's comparable to para vertebral block in terms of 24-hour opioid consumption. So, from this, uh, maybe we, it is a good sign that you can re you don't need to do para vertebral block for your for your patient undergoing mastectomy. You can do PEX2 for the patient. How about the serratus anterior plane block? Well, um, evidence oh. is not much, but uh, actually the application of serratus anterior plane block is Actually, there's a lot. People that use it for breast surgery, uh, thoracic surgery, rib fracture, and even upper abdominal surgery. I read case report for upper rib abdominal surgery also. So, yeah, there's one uh, low quality evidence uh, or a meta-analysis done in 2009, published in 2019. So, yeah, most of the patients undergo mastectomy, thoracotomy, and BATS. Well, it shows a reduction in 24-hour opioid consumption up to 11 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent, but there's no significant dif difference between the paravertebral block. But this, um, but due to the 
heterogeneity and uh, maybe problem with the RCT. Lah. So the level of evidence is low. Next, we move on to the erector spinae plane block. So it was introduced in 2016 uh, as a case report, two, case, two cases only of uh, uh, chest wall pain. So, but <laughs> since then, people have used it for so many other things <laughs> to treat, uh, for thoracic surgery, breast surgery, abdominal surgery, spine surgery, and even lower limb surgery. So yeah, it has exploded. This block has actually exploded uh, in the recent years. Why? Because um, people think that it is the paravertebral, it's an easy paravertebral block, uh, minimal invasive paravertebral block, an easy paravertebral block. Because the mechanism of action is actually uh, largely unknown, but uh, people have postulated that actually the LA has really spread to the dorsal rami, uh, yeah. So uh, blocking the, 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 the dorsal rami. So uh, yeah, dorsal and ventral rami of the thoracic spinal nerve. So yeah. So how do you do it? Um, patient usually in a sitting, lateral also can, prone also can. You place the probe in a longitudinal parasagittal orientation at the level of the thoracic spine mm -hmm. uh, spinal process. You, I, I, you, how do you identify the T5 spinal process? You actually can count the spinal process of H by palpation. Okay, all right, sorry. Okay, uh, so yeah, well, I was, uh, yeah, you, how do you identify the T5 spinal process? You can actually identify by palpation, or you can actually uh, use ultrasound to scan the ribs and to identify the, the from the first rib until the fifth rib. And, and then uh, move medially towards the spinous process or the tra transverse process, sorry. In the end, you need to locate the transverse process in the in-plane approach. And there, you, at the level of a T5, you can actually identify the trapezius, rhomboid, and the erector spinae muscle. So usually, we will inject about 20 to 30 mils of local anesthetic. But actually, this uh, the amount of local anesthetic is uh, la the Adequate amount. Uh, most of the case report uh, use up to 30 mils. Uh, I'm just quoting based on case report. There are actually no proper trials done to determine how much volume is actually needed. So this is a picture to illustrate how you do the erector spinae plane block. Okay, the needle usually insert the needle in plane from a kefala to cow that uh, direction. And uh, yeah, this, this, is, this picture is just to illustrate when you scan from uh, medial to lateral or lateral to medial. If you put your, if you place the probe to lateral, you'll be seeing a rounded, uh, hypo, hy hy uh, the hypoechoic structure, which is the rib, rounded hypoechoic structure with the rib with the uh, pleura sliding in between. If you uh, place your needle to medial, you end up losing the transverse process and seeing the lamina of the vertebra. So you must place the probe ex uh, exactly above the transverse process. You must uh, then only there will be a chance that the LA will spread to the ventral and dorsal rami and probably to the paravertebral space. All right. So evidence-wise, um, well, actually, erector spinae plane block. There is no uh, evidence that to show that this block should be recommended for uh, as a part of a multimodal uh, strategy in the surgery involving a, even in thoracic surgery. Uh, for your information, um, the, according to the prospect study is published in the, the, the European journals, um, for thoracic surgery, the mainstay is still paravertebral block, uh, still paravertebral block or thoracic epidural. The ESP, they, they, have, they actually do not accept ESP because, because of the lack of proper RCT. Uh, yeah. And we don't know actually how much volume of LA we need to use. Okay. Um, last, I would like to introduce this uh, pectal intercostal fascia plane block because I think it's a very simple uh, block to perform for sternotomy. Yeah, because it was first described in 2014 for breast surgery. 
it targets the anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve. Uh, usually we put it at the second and fourth intercostal space. Lah. Yeah. So yeah, this is the anatomy of the uh, hemithorax. This is the sternum. And actually the anterior branch of the intercostal nerve actually runs through the uh, intercostal muscle and the pec may, uh, it's un underneath the pec major. So you can actually catch this nerve between the pec major and the intercostal muscle. Yeah, but beware there's an internal thoracic artery running behind the intercostal muscle. So usually patient will be in the supine position. It's a, we use a linear, because it's a superficial block, the linear probe is at, uh, placed longitudinally lateral to the sternum. So, and then you can identify the pec major, the rib, and the intercostal muscle. So you, and you try to identify the internal thoracic artery as well and its branches so that you don't go to that place. So the needle is placed from caudal to cranial. From, uh, and then you place the tip of the needle between the pec major and the intercostal muscle. The volume is usually uh, two to three mils. So uh, you place it at the second and uh, fourth intercostal space. So if you are uh, for sternotomy, so maybe you will end up using four, four injections, total about less than 20 cc, lah, about 20 cc. Yep. All right. So yeah, this is a picture to illustrate how the block is being done. Yeah, you place the needle in between the pec major and the uh, intercostal muscle. So actually this block also, they are actually, you want to say that there's evidence, well, there's no strong evidence, but uh, theoretically, I mean, since the nerve run through that area, yeah, it should be a, a good uh, block uh, to perform, I mean, relatively simple and safe and um, and also it uh, can be part of the multimodal strategy, uh, maybe for the CABG. Lah. Yep. Okay, uh, but uh, I cannot guarantee that the, how efficacious is it, how, how impactful it is to, uh, towards the, your practice, how well it will impact your practice. Lah. Uh, so what is the way forward? Well, interfacial plane blocks, there are growing numbers every now and then. Every now and then you see someone trying to create one new block. Uh, then uh, and big, yeah, there's growing interest because most of the time you are not uh, injecting the nerve. So yeah, you are, you are just injecting through fascia planes. But uh, sadly, sadly, there's, for now, there's a uh, lack of clinical impact means we are not seeing a uh, improvement in outcome like uh, reduced hospital stay or increase um, uh, early mobilization uh, yeah fast track sur uh, surgeries so and if you want to study you need to have well designed rcts and yeah it it has the potential to be incorporated into multimodal analgesia techniques and it, um, I do believe it has a role in uh, ERAS, but uh, so far, actually so far, uh, so far in uh, most of the ERAS uh, protocol, we do not uh, incorporate uh, interfacial, interfacial plane block. So yeah, if however you are interested uh, in to, to, to incorporate interfacial plane block in your, in your practice, there are certain things you need to, um, you need to understand. You need to, you need to make sure that it has some, uh, it has any, and you need to make sure that it's a safe, yeah, safe in terms that uh, it has minimal complications. Like, uh, it can be performed in patient with coagulopathy or or not. Can uh, does it produce uh, increased uh, risk of uh, bleeding or or nausea vomiting? Then uh. You need to check after you perform it. You need to to check its impact on your outcome, like uh, length of stay, early mobilization, and it has to be easy to perform. Lah. means everyone can perform uh, from MO level up to specialist level, yeah. So that it can be easily incorporated into your practice, and you need to organize 
a protocol uh, that make it part of your practice. And it needs to be cost effective. Yeah, usually the cost will, if, uh, will involve usage of ultrasound, uh, block needles, and also um, uh, uh, local anesthetic, uh, and also sometimes uh, the sterile gel, you need to do under sterile technique, uh, sterile pack, yeah, sterile cover. Yeah, so all this you need to consider when you want to introduce a new technique into your practice. Okay, so uh, these are my references. And with that, I end my talk. Uh, thank you. Yeah, any questions from the floor? Hi, uh, Linda here. Can you hear me? Hi, hi. Yeah, hi, hi. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. Yes, hi. I can hear you. Thank you so much uh, for presenting to us. Um, actually, uh, in Sedang, most, likely, most of the things we do generally is tab block. La. So uh, uh -huh. my question is actually uh, for tab block. So, uh, you know, like like appendix, especially for appendix, la, we like to do a tab block, right? Okay. Uh, is it actually really helpful or not in the post-op? Uh, because it's more like a visceral pain, right? For appendix ectomy. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, actually, if you really, really want to cover the visceral pain, uh, what you can do is you can try the uh, posterior tap block, means uh, you in, uh, uh, inject the local anesthetic at the aponeurosis where the transverse mm. abdominis muscle end. And it's even better if you can visualize the quadratus lumborum muscle. It means you place yeah. your probe at right to the back. And yeah. Uh, and alternatively, uh if you are okay with you you can actually perform a quadrat transmuscular quadratus lumborum block because the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block is known to have uh visceral effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. and block visceral effect, yeah. But in general, um, I think uh, if, yes, I agree. If you do a bit just a lateral tap, it blocks the somatic uh, sensation of the uh, the lower thoracic nerve T10 to T12. Yeah. Um, yeah, it cannot be used as a sole analgesic technique. It must be combined with the opioids. Yeah, but uh, I think that it do have a role in the uh, in, in multimodal analgesia it, it, to, to reduce the opioid consumption. Yeah, because I think, because I believe that uh, pain, uh, uh, post uh, abdominal pain, post-operative abdominal pain can have both uh, visceral and somatic components. So you cover the somatic component, uh, mm -hmm. then if you cover the somatic component well, then uh, uh, it, is, it, 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 it is good. Uh, you can reduce the opioid consumption. However, yes, I, I need to stress again, uh, the evidence for tap block is actually not good. Uh, not mm. good. For, yeah, those mainly the studies are on a cesarean section. So you can infer that to appendicectomy. So meaning that, uh, yeah, you really need to look in. If you really want the better block, maybe you have to try something other than lateral tap. You have at least maybe you should try a posterior tap or transmuscular quadratus lumborum block. I know it's uh, more difficult. It is difficult, especially the uh, transmuscular quadratus lumborum block is very difficult. You have to use a curvilinear probe. You have to inject from the back, like doing a lumbar plexus block. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's very challenging. Uh, but if you are willing to try, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. Second, my second question is also about tab block, but this is for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, yeah. right? So I uh, earlier mentioned that actually it's not really much, uh, you know, uh, show any major benefit compared to versus with wound infiltration, correct? Yeah. Is that the one, right? Okay, yeah. uh, so basically if we <laughs> wound infiltration, I mean, it doesn't really, uh, not a major benefit, not even a moderate benefit. Is that so? Yes, I would say for lap coli, if it's lap coli per se, yeah, I might as well just do a wound infiltration. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree. Yes, yes. But um, the, because if you want to do a tap block, 
uh-huh. or laparoscopic surgery. To the the uh, thought insertion or from the uh, distension of the abdomen due to the pneumoperitoneum. Mm-hmm. We're going to block some of the somatic sensation. You cannot maybe causing some uh, numbness in the lower abdomen, but you miss the upper abdomen. So. So yeah, if you really, really want to do a tap block or laparoscopic surgery, you need to understand if you want to block the pain of the uh, of the port side and also the the distension of the element, then you you need to do a subcostal tap or mm-hmm. maybe a, a four quadrant tap up to maybe a four quadrant tap. So that's it's it, 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 it's too troublesome maybe for the laparoscopic <laughs> surgery. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, for a quadrant yes, tap, there be a lot of LA also, right? So the strategy for that is actually to minimize the concentration. Yes, for ropivacaine, but uh, you can dilute your ropivacaine down to 0.3 to 0.2 even. Yeah, mm-hmm. then you can increase the the volume of your local anesthetic up to 60 mils. So you can get uh, about 15 mils per quadrant. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if your patient is small size. You have to calculate the maximum dose that is allowable for uh, ropivacaine is uh, 3 mg per kilo. For levopubivacaine, you can go up to 2.5 mg per kilo. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But of course, I need to stress again, uh, in the in the ERAS uh, recommendation, uh, there is mm. no trunker block. They, mm. Because they already... Um, Use a uh, minimal invasive surgery. They don't see uh, uh, the don't see a need to recommend uh, blocks. Uh, they just use simple uh, local anesthetic infiltration at the port side. Uh, mm. That yeah, that's what they recommend. Uh, so yeah, but that's just a recommendation by Iran. Then they they don't expect you to uh, incorporate hundred percent. You can change uh, to suit your local need. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much for answering the question, Dr. Ng. Thank you. Oh, actually, sorry, Linda back again. And my last question, I forgot. Ah, um, yes, yes. It's okay. It's okay. Pediatric tap block. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I'm, uh, I need to apologize because uh, I, I actually, for the, because um, the, uh, since the maternal and child hospital has separated oh. from, from <laughs> first HKL, I mean, they have a separate hospital now, separate yes. administration. I've yes. seldom been to there, but to my understanding, yes, yes uh, our pediatric anesthetist uh, actually, yeah, uh, she actually came back, after she came back from overseas, she actually learned the quadratus lumbarum block. Okay. I think it's a posterior tap, lah, I mm. think. I think it's a posterior tap. Yes, she start to incorporate um, nerve blocks for children. Yeah, undergoing uh, laparotomies, undergoing uh, maybe hernia repairs. Yes, instead of using the fat caudal la or the ilio inguinal block. Yeah, yeah, they are incorporating uh, more of this. Uh, they, I think they incorporate the posterior tap or QL. If not mistaken, depends oh. on the the. Uh, of course, uh, evidence is. Lacking, <laughs> mm-hmm. yes, because in pediatric it's very hard to get uh, proper <laughs> study also la. Yeah, but um, the when when the our pediatric anesthetist came back from England uh, from a uh, UK uh, training, she started because I think she learned there and then she start incorporating into yeah it's, it's very important I would say it's, in pediatric is uh, very important you want to you it's to provide an opioid sparing, like opioid sparing. I wouldn't say opioid free and anesthesia. I would say opioid sparing anesthesia. So mm-hmm. it's very, very good. So um and um yeah, and less invasive like if compared to a caudal caudal epidural. Yeah. yeah yes. And and one more thing about pediatrics, uh, uh, 
the block is actually, to my understanding, the trunkal block of PDI is actually relatively flat. I would say relatively easier. No way. Compared to adults, no, adult, no, no way. You if unless it's super thin, lah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, Dr. Ng, for such a profound session. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you. And stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.